Right, welcome everybody to week 14, day two. I've updated my wallpaper engine background here to celebrate the coming of spring and a little Hanami cherry blossom viewing action going on here in the background. Um, say your wallpaper to highest priority so your old wallpaper doesn't show up when starting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I have mine muted and I do have uh, color effects on my keyboard turned on, so I can't really lift my keyboard up, but the, the colors of the wallpaper change the color of my uh, Corsair keyboard, which is uh, kind of cool. Kinda cool. All right, week 13, I, I don't know. Like, I, I still don't know if we're supposed to count the uh, spring break or not. So um, according to the school, I got I got the uh, weekly update and they're like, it's week 14. I'm like, oh, okay, so we got one less, got one less week in the semester. Okay. So uh, what should we talk about today? Uh, we've got two big topics left in the um, semester. The first really big one is called inheritance. And then we also need to talk about bit fields a little bit. And um, what else do we really need to hit? Um, we've kind of covered exceptions already, right? Do we cover exceptions? We covered exceptions, right? Just a little bit, throw, try, catch, throw. Uh, cannot count past 10, so I cannot assist. Um, do you guys remember exceptions? Like throw, try, catch. Pretty sure we talked about that, yeah. A little bit. Talked about it a little bit. And so this is this is oftentimes used for um, Calm down there, dude. Calm down. All right. I should probably update my macro, shouldn't I? Let me do that. Let me show you guys how to set up a macro. You guys ready to learn how to do macroing in Vim? This is actually a really useful skill and might tie in with the, you know, the benchmarking thing we did, right? By the way, all of your reports have been graded. So all the hash table stuff is in and done, graded. Is there a difference between exception and std except? Yeah. Yeah, the way they have the exceptions laid out in um, the header files is bizarre. It's really, it's really weird. Some of the some of the exceptions are in one, some are in another, and I'm sure they have a good reason for it, but it, it's those reasons are opaque to me. I do not understand why. Okay, so how do we do a macro? For example, what if I wanted to... Um, what if I just wanted to throw in here, like, see out, uh, you know, hello world. You know, like maybe I'm doing see out debugging and I want to just, you know, kind of copy and paste this a bunch of times. And, but like, it's kind of annoying to YY and then go down and P. You, you can't hit dot, dot will repeat the last command you did. Did you guys know that? Dot, 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 right? Um, but you can write a macro for it. So you can make a macro so that I can create a, a macro like macro h for hello world. And then I can say run macro h and it'll dump see out hello world into the code. Cool. And you can have one of those macros bound to every key on your keyboard. So if there's anything you do commonly, like a for loop or something like that, uh, just macro f bloop, makes a for loop for you. And so that's that's like, a, you know, um, you know, the expanding brain meme. But uh, the, the, the first macro I almost always set up when doing Vim is just to put the header files in and make a main and stuff like that. Just because in this class I, I make quick programs so often I hate going hashtag include IO stream. No, I mistyped it. No. Make a macro for that. If you ever find yourself doing the same thing over and over again, make a macro for it. So uh, for your hash table assignment, we talked about unit shell scripting. Unit shell scripting is a great way of automating processes. So if there's a command you run from the command line over and over again, you put those commands into a text file, make the text file executable. You remember that? It's like uh, if you have a text file called test.sh and you put some commands in there, you do a chmod, user may execute test.sh, now you can run it like it's, it's an executable. Right. So that's Unix shell scripting, great for automation. Now we're gonna do Vim automation. So if you wanna automate keystrokes in Vim, and uh, trust me when I say this has saved me a lot of time. Like if I ever need to refactor code, 
and um, go through and change a bunch of lines of code over and over again, like spoiler alert, your next homework assignment will require, then pay attention. Okay, so how do you do a macro? Um, um, let's see, what, uh, is there anything? Well, what do you think should be in the default? What do you think should be in the default? Vector, I think, I think I'm gonna switch it to public read just because I, I tend to use that. IO stream kind of annoys me now. Ranges, raid ranges. Maybe, I don't use those enough though. Mm -hmm. Algorithm maybe? Yeah. Okay, all right, so here we go. So how do you record a macro? Q. Q is the Q is the vim command to start recording macro, but Q by itself does not do anything. You have to follow it up with another letter. So I'm gonna go Q M, M is for main. Now look at the bottom left corner, bottom, let's see, things made, there you go. Bottom left corner of my screen. Uh, you will see that it says recording macro m. The uh, at character means macro. And in fact, you invoke a macro by typing at ship2, at m. And then whatever I type in here, those keystrokes will get replayed later. And they could be any keystrokes. They could be like delete five words, and then I can make a macro for that and it would delete five words. Or I can, you know, make a macro that will uh, print out hello world. But for now, I'm just going to do my standard... Uh, Greenfield, bloop, I'm just gonna start off a project without having to waste your class time on it. Okay, so I'm recording M. All right, so uh, I'm still not in insert mode, so I'm gonna type I and go into insert mode. And you can see down there, down there, it says insert recording macro M. So I'm in insert mode and still recording. So I'm gonna say hashtag include slash public slash read dot H, hashtag include Wecker, hashtag include, algorithm, hmm. I guess it's gonna for now. Using namespace std, and main, open close parentheses, open curly brace, return, return, close curly brace, up, and tab, and that looks good to me. Okay, so then how do I stop recording? I just hit Q again. So you see it's still recording my keystrokes. And all those arrow keys that I hit, all the typos I made, all of those are gonna be replayed. So I could actually come in and clean those typos out. It doesn't matter then. So I hit Q again, boom, it's been saved. Now let's open up a new file. Flu.cc, at M, boom, there it is, at M. And it replays it. It's nice. So, uh, and, and so those macros are actually saved between quitting them and loading them and between files, you can have your macros just set up. And if there's commands you do over and over again in Vim, you can just save them um, as a macro and then you're good to go. Okay, so Vim exceptions.cc, you got this. And um, x equals read, please enter a number from zero to then uh, true. If x is less than zero or x is greater than ten, then throw one time error if it stood except. Throw run time error. Um, No, you are out of bounds. Okay. Uh, otherwise, um, constant passcode equals seven. If x is less than passcode. Also, if x is greater than passcode, it's out too high. Else, it's out. access. 
and we will break out of the out welcome to the mainframe so we have a little we have a little password thing here right the user has to type in a number from 0 to 10 if they type in number too low prints too low if they type in number too high but if they make an error then it throws an exception now notice that none of my code is handling any exceptions in that case what happens is the exception goes up the call stack if main calls a function a which calls a function b which calls a function c and C throws, if C doesn't catch it, then it tries B. B doesn't catch it, it goes to A. If A doesn't catch it, it goes to main. If main doesn't catch it, it goes to the C runtime. C++ runtime, and the C++ runtime will kill your program and print whatever error message you put in here. Okay, so if I compile a exception, that, uh, enter a number five, too low, 10, too high, 11, terminate called after throwing instance of std runtime error. What? No, you are out of bounds. Abort core dumped. So an exception should only be used in exceptional circumstances. I wouldn't even do it in, in a case like this. Really, I would just have the input routine be like, uh, no, try again, you know. But uh, this is sort of a proxy for more complicated situations where let's say that somebody is trying to pop off your stat class, right? You got a stat class, it's empty. And somebody tries popping off it. You can't return in, like, it's a stack of integers, let's say. You can't return zero. You can't return negative one. You can't return 10. Because all of those are numbers that you could feasibly return. And so exceptions are used in, in circumstances where the normal, the normal flow of control is insufficient. So you call pop. It's got to return something. The function returns an int. But you can't return it. There's no int that is valid to be returned. So you throw an exception instead. That's usually what it's. What's, what it's for. And so if I want to catch this, uh, I could put in here a try block. And down here I could catch all exceptions. Dot, dot, dot means all exceptions. Catch everything, even things that aren't exceptions, technically. See how it is, you know, whatever. And if I type, throw an exception now, it goes bzz, Fifth element, Ruby Rod, Ruby Road. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Or I can make the catch only catch runtime errors, right? So I can have it catch any runtime error E, and then um, I could print out E dot what, what, and it will print out the message that the uh, person that wrote the exception put in there. Warning, catching polymorphic type by value. Yes, thank you. Four, eight, seven, welcome to the mainframe. One, zero, negative 10. Bzz. No, you are out of bounds. Okay. So, uh, runtime error will go up the call stack and see if anybody has a try catch block that is going to catch its type of error. Dot, dot, dot will catch any error. Uh, in this case, I'm specifically only catching runtime errors. If I threw some other type of exception, it wouldn't catch it. It goes up the call stack, up the call stack, up the call stack. In other words, the functions who call functions who call functions, it goes up. And if none of them catch it, if main doesn't catch it, then the C++ runtime catches it and kills your program. Okay. That makes sense to you guys. They're used extensively in computer science. So um, they're typically not found in my um, homework assignments because I want you guys to just handle them directly usually. You could have two different runtime errors through different types and catch both. Um, well, runtime errors are a type, right? Um, but like, um, say it was not using the read library and we did this and we say if not cn throw a different one timer uh, you did not type in a 
and int. You should be a shame. The read library doesn't have the, those concerns, but you know, if you're a normal person writing normal C++ code, if I type in something that is not an integer, then it throws. Do not type in an int, you should feel ashamed. If I type in a number like negative 1,000, it'll say you're out of bounds. And so you can distinguish between the two of those uh, using e.what. What contains the string that was thrown out. So you can figure out, and you can also catch different types. Like you can actually have multiple catch blocks, like in this one, it'll catch everything. So on success, if we throw 42, if I type in squirrel, if I type in negative 100, if I type in seven, seven throws now, it throws, not even an exception, you can throw anything, you can throw an integer, in this case I threw an integer. And so the, I'm throwing the number 42 or whatever. Um, and so this code block here is catching it and putting bzz and quitting. So you can have multiple catch blocks on every try block if you want. Okay, um, assertion failed. Yeah, that's a, that's another way you can do this, honestly. Um, you know, you could assert, uh, you could assert CN and that of course requires the hashtag include C assert library, which as you can tell is from C, from the C world. So if we do this and type in scroll, now we get an assertion field, right? Exceptions.cc line 15 and main assertion CN failed. So kills your program, kills your program. An exception doesn't have to kill your program, right? If you're catching, if you're catching a, if you're catching an exception, it doesn't have to kill your program. You just be like, um, yeah, we, we went out of bounds, terminating this comp computation, resuming, you know, whatever. Um, it's not even a matter of being prettier. It's like, you don't have to quit, right? Like I could, you know, I could go through all this rigmarole and then do while true um, system full and uh, figure it. So if I, uh, and use result, yeah, it's fine. Um, so if I type in one, nine, if I type in squirrel, the assert fails and it quits. But now if I throw an exception, it goes into an infinite loop of, right, it does, it does, uh, ah, kill, kill, kill. <laughs> yeah, disco is taking over. Okay, it's too funny. But let's put a you sleep in there. You sleep for a uh, tenth of a second. You sleep is in Unix standard. There we go. So it's pausing a tenth of a second between each call. Now I can quit it because what was happening was I was hitting control C and it was killing it was killing the subshell but it wasn't killing the program one second divided by 30 so this will run 30 frames a second there you go. So there you go. Yeah. An unkillable program. <laughs> it's close buddy at that point, man. <laughs> uh, so what what returns the string? So when it, whenever you use an exception, um, like runtime error, you can you can pass to the constructor, right? This is a constructor. The constructor takes a const char star a string, C style string. And um, yeah, and then you can get that by calling e.what. So this 
this catches the exception that was thrown and then we can see what the error message was and we can actually have an if statement in there and say if the if the what is you're out of bounds do this if it was this do this now just play blue monday on by new order I'm trying to give me a copyright strike huh hmm. see copyright free blue monday See if let's see if we get a copyright free strike for copyright free music. You can't hear it. Ah. How about now? There you go, you didn't know it turned into a rave. All right, so, uh, cool. That's exceptions again. Let's go. All right, uh, move exceptions into slash. You guys can enjoy that. Yeah, grooving cat, very good, very good. Uh, what was in it one night at the Roxbury? in the car. Uh -huh. All right. So uh, let's talk about bit fields. This is going to be your next homework assignment. So let's talk about it. Okay. So vim bit field dot cc. Here's a new data structure. <laughs> you guys ready for this? All right, there we go. <clears throat> that is our data structure. An integer, the final boss. <laughs> but you have not yet seen my final form. Yes, the final data structure in data structures is an integer. <laughs> So, uh, but I thought you said a bit field is multiple variables, right? Like a data, a data structure, sorry. A data structure is anything that holds multiple variables, right? So uh, this is in fact a data structure. Why? It holds 32 bits. Mm -hmm. So we're on a 32 bit system. I wanted to be a little bit more careful with this. I could be like, um, So unsigned integer, 32-bit type. So, um, yeah, so this is a unsigned 32-bit integer. It's the same. Same thing as if I wrote this. Okay, same thing. Uh, but uh, int, because int can change sizes based on your platform, um, if, if you're going to be using bit fields, especially where 
you expect there to be 32 bits, you should pretty damn well better say this is a 32 bit int, right? If you want 64 bit ints, specify it. Like long, long is fine for filthy casuals, but um, in this case, it'd be an unsigned long, long. But um, no, if, if, if you're gonna be using bit fields and each one of those bits is gonna be like a different variable, you should really choose the uh, specific amount of bits you want. And if you don't need 64 bits, then uh, by all means use an 8-bit or a 16-bit as well. We'll just go whole hog, and we're going to use 64 whole bits of memory. <clears throat> Big spender right here. Big spender. 64 whole bits of memory. So, yeah, Code Wars is cool. Yeah, uh, so on, on Discord, for those of you at home, um, they were talking about Bitfield showing up in a Code Wars uh, competition and uh, Code Wars is a just a it's a good place to practice your coding skills. There's a I'll, I'll write these down here just so you can see them. Um, hacker rank, hacker rank, um, Code Wars, uh, Code Kata. Uh, what was the name of it? What was the name of it? Uh, Code Kata. Yeah. Dojo. Let's see. I think uh, Code Wars uses Code Kata. Does it? For okay. their challenges, yeah. Okay. The, um, the, you can also submit your own on Code Wars. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, Coding Horror. This is uh, made by the guy who made Stack Overflow. I actually read his blog a, a long time before I even knew what Stack Overflow was. He was always just talking about, oh, this is a website I made called Stack Overflow. I'm like, I don't care about your stupid website, you know. And then I was like, oh, you're that guy, Jeff Atwood. And so, yeah, so he recommends doing code katas or, or practices, like how karate people do katas to practice their techniques. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, there's a number of websites like that. Uh, there's more whose names are skipping me right now, but it's it's really good for getting practice. Like the biggest problem that I see in computer science is students kind of like they attend class and like they see me write like the exception code and they're like, oh, okay, I get it, but then they don't do anything with it. And if you don't do anything with it, then you forget it, right? Like I'm going to demonstrate bit fields right now, and maybe you and and that's why I give you a homework assignment on it. So you get practice doing it, so you understand it. But a lot of students <clears throat> don't do the homework, and then they really don't learn it. Then you're really stuck. Like if you if you've been going through this class, not doing the homework, you need to really step your game up, put your foot down on the gas pedal, and like go through those old homework assignments and, and get them done. It's the only way really to understand. Um, but these websites here are good places to practice your your coding. Like every uh, winter break, summer break, whatever, I go on there on to different places and I just run through exercises to keep my mind sharp. And oftentimes I'll learn different things or see new problems that I haven't seen before. Um, in computer science, you, it's like, it really is like learning a foreign language. You have to just practice it, you know? Like, if I don't practice Japanese, like, oof, you know, it's not good, you know? You, and in Japanese one, you, you learn really quick who the diligent students are and who the non-diligent students are, you know? It's real, real obvious. Um, and in computer science, it's, you know, there's no way around it. You just gotta, you just gotta grind. You gotta work. You gotta push yourself. It helps if you like it. You don't have to like it, but it helps. You know, if you enjoy that sensation of success from solving a, a tricky problem, all test cases pass. Like, yes. Um, and yeah, computer science for you. Um, Code Wars, by the way, also sorts them by belt level. So you have white belt and black belt problems and thing, everything in between. And so uh, if you're not a good programmer, you just pick white belt problems. And those are pretty easy. They're like a few lines of code and you can, you can get comfortable solving them. Hacker rank doesn't have very many intro level questions, but um, it does tie in with um, headhunters and recruiters. And so you can, put your, you can put your resume up on hacker rank and hacker rank records which problems you've solved and then recruiters can be like, hey, I'm looking for C++ developers in the Fresno area that have a this level of competency in C++. 
And if you've passed that pet, that point in hacker rank, then you'll get a call from a headhunter. Right? It's kind of cool. So uh, I think Code Wars has something like that too, as well, for recruitment. Code Wars are anything like my martial art training days. They'll probably lose a lot. We'll get in the hang of it, but I'll learn a ton. You can't lose at Code Wars. It, it, it sounds like a war, but it's not. It's not. It's it's just here's a problem, solve it. Yeah, it's not. You, there's no possibility for losing, really. Um, the only way you can lose is to not try. So, um, yeah. All right. So here is our next. Here is our next data structure, an int. <laughs> so. So how do we how do we access individual bits? So what we want to do is treat these sixty four uh, bits in a sixty four bit integer as if we had done something like this, like a like a boolean something like that, right? You guys see how these are kind of the same things. So this is. 64 bits here, and this is a array of booleans here, 64. And so we want to be able to just individually read and write individual bits. So for example, if we are making another RPG, which uh, I'm still grading, trust me, it just takes a really long time to go through them. Um, yeah, bools are just zeros and ones, right? And so what if I had, um, uh, what if I had uh, constant, uh, the red key, one and constant the blue key is two. So what if I had a bunch of items that you could pick up? Um, constant um, the dandelion. Ah. And so basically in, in this inventory system, you either have an item or you don't have an item. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Some sometimes when you do inventories you can have multiple things like how many shells you, you're holding or something. I don't know. Uh, how, I wonder how much memory inventory two takes up compared to this one. Great question. So see out size of in, inventory. Size of inventory. By the way, I'm using W. Um, so I could I could go one letter at a time, arrow 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 arrow, right? Which I do sometimes. Um, or you do w w w w w w w goes forward one word at a time. B b b b b b b goes backwards one word at a time. So if you're if I'm like over here and I need to get over there, I just w a bunch, right? So it's faster, much faster, very efficient. Okay. Maximum results for minimum effort. That's the motto of judo and computer science. Okay, so let's compile bitfield.cc, run it, and you will see that the array of the array of 64 booleans is taking up 64 bytes of memory. The unsigned long long is taking up eight bytes. Remember, every byte is eight bits. There are eight bits in a byte. Any of you guys know what half a byte is? Four bits? Any of you know what half a byte is called in computer science? Half a byte? I know Muya knows because I teach this in 45. It's called a nibble. Yeah. So half a byte is a nibble. Is there a way to go to the starting end of a line? Hell yeah, of course there is. This is Vim we're talking about. Okay. But here's the weird thing, right? We're holding 64 bits, but it's consuming 64 bytes. This array of booleans we're using here is actually eight times wasted space. It's it's holding 64 bytes when it could be holding 64 bits. So using an int, a long, long int here, is eight bytes, which is what we need to hold 64 booleans. But if we made an array of them, oof, it's wasteful. That's because a boolean, <clears throat> a boolean, uh, the smallest, uh, if you have a byte addressed memory system, each boolean gets its own byte. So the, the closest it can pack it together is one byte per Boolean. And, and sometimes the bits will actually be held in ints. And so on some systems, a bool is actually um, an int, which is 32 bits. 
So it uses 32 bits to hold one bit. So, yeah. So anyhow, um, if you want to go to the front of the line, use caret. Shift six is caret. Um, caret takes you to the beginning of the line. Dollar sign takes you to the end of the line. And that's used in a lot of uh, shell scripting as well, like you're typing things. And then you want to go back to the beginning of the line. Shift six takes you to the beginning. Um, also using search and replace stuff. Uh, usually I don't I don't hit that because hitting shift four to go to the end of the line involves me having to like move my hand and hit the shift and hit the four. It's a little slow. And so what I do instead is um, I will hit shift five, shift, shift A. Shift A takes me to the end of the line and puts me in into, into insert mode, which is usually what I want. And if I want to go to the beginning of the line and go into insert mode, it's shift I. Shift I, jump to the beginning of the line, go into insert mode. Shift A, go to the end of the line, go into insert mode. And that's faster to hit than shift four, which is more of a reach with your finger. These commands are universal for Unix and Linux. No, this is a Vim thing. This is a Vim thing. Uh, Unix, the Unix prompt has a completely different set of shortcuts um, for going to the beginning, going to the end of the line. I believe nowadays you just hit home. Yeah, home will take you to the beginning and will take you to the end. But there's also, yeah, I, I don't remember what the, there, there's some control shortcut you can use as well, but I just use home and end because it's on my keyboard. So. Um, home and end also work in Vim, by the way. Uh, shift A, Shift I, Shift 4, and Shift 6. Yeah, so Shift 6, beginning of line. Carrot is beginning of line. Dollar sign is end of line. And, and you'll see this, like, when you see people doing, like, search and replaces, you'll see them say, like, carrot hello. That means hello at the beginning of the line. Only find lines that begin with hello. So it's actually really important, you know, carrot and dollar sign. Find at the end of the line this, this thing. O opens below. Shift O opens above. I use those all the time. All the time. Because otherwise, what people do is, like, if they want to start a new line, they, they do this. It's so painful watching people do that at the tutorial center. <laughs> Such in the scroll. All Append. The to the end. Return. Eh. Yeah. Oh. Or, or watching people use paste. Whenever they use paste, they they think they need to to go open up a new line because they don't know that paste automatically paste below. So yeah. Why? So why? And do then... the same thing. Yeah, and then they'll go all the way to the end, go into insert. <laughs> it's even worse. P to paste. <laughs> doesn't doesn't matter where you are. Shift P pastes above, uh, lowercase P pastes below. Okay, a little vim right there. Okay, so anyway, so let's say that we're trying to do a inventory system, and we want to have that, you know, we have 64 possible items that somebody can pick up. Um, so what we can do is this. There are three things we can do with a bit field. You can add to bit field. You can delete from a bit field. You can see if a bit is set. So these are the three operations we can do on a bit field. Insert, search, and delete. <laughs> same, you know, same as you know, it's your basic operations on every thing. So uh, how do we how do we pick up the blue key? Anyone wanna give you some code that will have inventory hold the blue key? Got my dirty chai right here. So chai iced tea with a little espresso added. Yeah, I want to pick up the blue key. So uh, I've, I'm making some sort of role playing game. There's three items right now. I'm still developing it. Uh, but the red key opens the red door. The blue key opens the blue door. That's just how it works. That's the rule in a video game. And then I don't know. I can have a dandelion or a gun or something. Yeah. So how do I pick up the blue key? 
well, I could just do this, right? I could say like inventory equals blue key, right? I guess that would work. But now what if I want to pick up the red key? I could say inventory equals red key. But now I don't have the blue key anymore, right? Because inventory is set to one. I want to keep it, right? I want to have both the blue key and the red key. I want inventory to be set to three afterwards. Good, good, sure. I could I could say inventory plus equals red key. Sure, we could do that. Now, what if I pick up the red key again? Now I've got no red key, I've got no blue key, but I've got a dandelion, which is probably a bug. If you pick up the same item multiple times, like you pick up a pistol here, you pick up a pistol there, um, now you've got a laser gun. I don't know, like it doesn't make sense to me. So we can't, we can't use just equals. We cannot use just plus equals. We have to use bit operators. So in C++, there are uh, bitwise operators for and, or, and not. And there's also XOR, but don't worry about that right now. And it looks like this. Inventory is equal to inventory bitwise ORed with red key. So what the hell does that do? Notice that's an OR with one vertical slash, not two vertical slashes. Not two vertical slashes, it's one vertical slash. Okay. And that will pick up the red key. And that will pick up the red key again, which will do absolutely nothing because we already have it. And this will pick up the blue key. So what the hell is going on here? To the presentation, I guess. All right, I've got some examples set up for you guys. Enable editing. Save. Okay, so my mom always used to say programming is just working with zeros and ones, and that's usually uh, it's usually not the case, right? Usually we don't stare at giant glowing screens of zeros and ones, be like, ah, yes, that bug's right. Clearly, uh, that, that one should be a zero, clearly. <laughs> so, um, uh, can use the and and or keywords instead of vertical slash and, no. Those are those are for logical and and or, you cannot use them. Uh, I believe there is a bit uh, a bitwise and, um, something like that you can write out. Okay, so uh, usually, usually we don't care about individual bits. We usually care about entire variables. But today we're going to be working with individual bits. We're going to learn how to set a bit inside of a variable, how to see if a bit is set, and to clear a bit if we want. And um, when you know this kind of stuff, you can actually uh, compress things down quite a bit, um, substantially in some cases. Um, some programs just send giant XML pages to and from each other, and yeah, they'll they'll maybe use channel compression or something like that, but like, like back in my day, like when I went to email, it would just load. Let's count this. Let's go to my email. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Twenty-six seconds for my inbox to come up, and I have I have the top tier internet available in my area. It's twenty-six seconds to load an inbox, an inbox. Not even like loading, you know, the attachments or any of that stuff. That was just for my inbox to come up. Like, what the hell? And this is from Microsoft. You know, it's not like it's some third bit, you know, company that's hosting my email. It's Microsoft who has one of the biggest, you know. Uh, data center presences outside of Google, right? And Amazon, right? Azure is a big thing and it is not fast and it bugs me because back in the day when people had dial up, the network was faster and that's weird. <laughs> it's weird to me that I had a 
56k modem that could load my email faster than you know what you just saw right there on AT&T's best service whatever it is like 80 megabits a second or something like that okay I guess I could get a cable modem but yeah this is this is as good as it gets for AT&T at least so um, I saw a video dial up in the sound it makes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's the sound of the internet coming on yeah, and so uh, the the reason for this is just that programmers just don't care about bits anymore. And um, that would be fine if it was fast still, but the internet is literally less responsive now than it was in the past, which is a really weird thing because internet speeds have gone up substantially, right? Um, when I was in the dorms um, as a freshman in 95 and 96, I had 100 megabit a second ethernet in my dorms and it was nice it was really nice and then um sophomore year they they didn't uh, give us any ethernet at all and so we wired our building ourselves with ethernet which was fun um and then junior year i had a cable modem and you know and that was probably about as fast as this these days because nobody had cable modems back then so yeah, there was um 97 98 when the first doxis won Kibble modems were rolling out. Like very few people knew about them, and I, I hopped on that bandwagon real fast because cable modems shared the bandwidth in the neighborhood, where they did back then. At least I don't know if they still do now. And so, you know, I had pretty good internet. And then, you know, you know, they, essentially the bandwidth was the same as today. But despite Microsoft having these giant data centers and all this bandwidth and stuff like that, you saw it took twenty five seconds for my inbox to load. It's utterly unacceptable. It's ridiculous. So. Uh, yeah, if your family needed to phone somebody and you're on the internet, they would pick up the phone. It would knock you offline. Yeah. yeah. And don't get me started on video games and how bad their networking code is. Okay, so uh, as we all know, a char is usually, it's usually 8 bits. A short is usually 16 bits. And then is usually 32 bits. Long, long, 64 bits. Boolean, um, like we just saw, Could be a could be a byte, could be an int. Depends. So uh, if we're just gonna be storing a bunch of if we're gonna be storing just a bunch of bools, we should bit pack. Okay. So there are a number of types where you can specify how many bits you want. Uh, these things are vague and then imprecise, you shouldn't use them if you actually care about the bits like you're doing in a bit field. Okay. So here we go. So there's these things called bit operations. And so what it is, it's you're, you're treating an integer not like it's an integer. You're not treating it like it's an integer at all. You're treating it like it's a vector. Like a 32-bit int, you're treating it like it's a vector of 32 booleans, right? So you're not going to be doing addition and subtraction. No. It's a vector of bools is what it is, right? And so um, uh, basically, if you, if you use an int, a 4-byte integer, a 32-bit integer, it's the same thing, uh, then... As long as your video game doesn't have more than 32 different items you can pick up. For example, in the original Quake, there was eight, nine weapons, something like that. Um, you could store that in a, you know, if there are eight weapons, you can store it in a char, right? A char is eight bits. And so if you wanted to send to a person a complete copy of their inventory, you send them a single letter worth of data. That's fast. Even a 56K modem, boom, there you go. You pick up a weapon, it sends out a char that holds which bits. The first bit corresponds to the axe, second bit corresponds to the shotgun, third bit corresponds to the double-barreled shotgun, fourth bit corresponds to the nail gun, fifth bit corresponds to the super nail gun, sixth bit corresponds to the grenade launcher, seventh bit corresponds to the rocket launcher, eighth bit corresponds to the laser gun. That's it. So when somebody picks up a weapon, the server will send you a single char. A single char. Remember, you get 56,000 chars per second on a 56k modem. A little less because you never get the max speed, but, you know, that's the idea. And so with one character, you can send the complete inventory of a player to them. And you don't need to send them the other stuff. You don't need to send their health or their armor and that kind of stuff because they know what they have. But if they take damage, then the server will send to them, you've lost 10 health. And you can send, you've lost 10 health in a char also. You know, maybe use a short, I don't know. But, um, you know, basically, if you really think about how network protocols work, 
you can really squeeze down the number of bits you need to send over the connection. And so you can have a perfectly playable experience with a dial-up. You know, the biggest problem with dial-up is just the latency, right? It, it, there's just, you're not gonna get any better than 200, 300 milliseconds of latency on a dial-up connection. But like, from a bandwidth perspective, you could play Quake on a 6K second. It, it takes, the, the bit rate on a connection between a Quake client and Quake server is 6K. 6,000 bits a second it's sending to you. And that's enough to update 10 times a second. So each update is at most, on average, 600 bits. So that's actually quite a lot, you know. There's 32 people on the server. They have 32 people on the server, which is better than Overwatch. You know, you can send, you can pick um, which person, like if somebody fires something, you send out an int, maybe, or maybe a char, because you can hold 32 numbers in a char. Sure. You send out a char saying this person fired his gun. You know, it's like two bytes. You know, you got 592 bits left to send, you know, per frame. So, um, yeah, highly responsive. And in the sad reality is that just people don't care about it these days, which, again, would be fine if it was actually responsive. Like, if, if the end product was actually fast, like, I wouldn't be complaining about it, right? Like, if I were to launch Pokemon Go right now, um, it takes, like, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds for it to load. You know, and if you if you click on a Pokestop, it doesn't load the Pokestop until the image of the Pokestop loads, and so you have to sit there. If you have one bar of coverage, you have to sit there and wait for a, a full resolution JPEG to load behind the scene before you can spin the damn Pokestop. Look, I don't care about what it looks like. I can see it in real life. I don't need to see it. It's right here in front of me. It's fine. You know, and so just companies just make all these really bad decisions, and they're very wasteful of bits because probably at Niantic headquarters. They've got 10 trillion gigabits a second, you know, connection, and they're sitting in downtown San Francisco that has really good cell phone coverage. So it just doesn't occur to them that there's parts of the world that have one and two bars of coverage, right? And it's, you know, almost unplayable if you have bad coverage, Pokemon Go. And it doesn't need to send anything. Like, it really doesn't need to send any data. There's a Pokestop there. I know where it is. My cell phone has cached the location of all this, the Pokestops in the area. I just want to spin it, dude. I just need to send to you a packet saying I spun Pokestop number 27 and you need to send back to me which items I got. That's all you need to do. One char, one char. That's it. And they, they force you to download an entire high-res JPEG before you can spin the damn thing. It's ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. So, uh, <laughs> so these are like thin packaging to lower the weight of data transfers. It's among other reasons. Among other reasons. I, the, the reason why I'm going on this rant is because if you can start thinking in terms of bits then and, and realizing how precious a bit is over especially over a network connection in ram who cares hash tables who cares boom a gigabyte of ram for hash table done whatever i don't care but if you if i'm going to be transferring just like a spare gig like do you know do you know that a lot of websites like they just download their entire javascript library to you when you connect to them like it just sits there and transmits this entire library they're not even using the whole thing they just transmit the whole framework to you and then it can start loading the page. And so you have to sit there and wait for all these JavaScript frameworks to download to your machine, and then it'll display your inbox or whatever. And it's stupid, it's stupid. And so, you know, Google does things like Google has um, relay servers where common JavaScript frameworks exist all over the world. And so when you try downloading one, it will find the nearest Google cache and download a copy of the entire framework from there. But you're still downloading who knows how much data you know and it's just because they're incredibly wasteful and people just think that bandwidth is free and infinitely fast and it's not networks are slow even today they're slow it's not like this is slower than my freshman dorm ethernet in 1995 which was when people were barely beginning to understand what the internet even was you know nobody even heard of the internet before about 93 except for people on you know the military and, and research institutions you know, 94, 95 was when people finally was like, oh, there's this thing called the internet. You know, I had 100 bit megabit a second when there wasn't even barely an internet, you know? And yeah, all right, ranting over. So um, here's what we do. So uh, there, we're gonna be focusing on and or not. There's also XOR, there's also shifting. I guess we'll cover those too, might as well, for the sake of completeness. But, um, if you want to grab an individual bit 
or set a bit or read a bit or delete a bit, uh, you have to use these bitwise operations. And so what when you have a bitwise operation, what happens is you have like, let's, what do we got here? A char and a char. A char is eight bits. And so if you bitwise and two different chars together, what happens is this. The first bits of each char are anded together and the result is returned. The second, the second bit of each char are bitwise anded together and the result of that goes into the second bit. The third bits from the two inputs are anded together and the output, goes, and the output of that goes into the third bit of the output. So for example, if you have one char that has 1111000 and the second char is 00001111, what happens is the first bit of each are anded together. One is true, zero is false. True anded with false is false. True anded with false is false. And then false ended with true is true. False ended with true is true. So might help if we do it. Um, might help if we do it vertically. So if we have, where's my mouse? There, yeah. So if we have 1100 and we bitwise and this with 1001, what you do is you, and so what number is this? This is one, two, four, eight. So this is 12. If we take 12 and we bitwise and it with nine, eight plus one is nine. 12 bitwise anded with nine, what you do is you go through each column. So the first bit of each is anded, the second bit of each is anded. Okay. So true anded with true is true. True anded with false is false. False anded with false is false. False anded with true is false. So 12 anded with nine is eight. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't be thinking of these things in terms of ints, because they're not really ints, they're bit fields. Okay, so we're doing a parallel operation. We're in fact doing four ands all at the same time. And that's another reason why we do bitwise operations. If you have a 64-bit uh, integer and each Boolean matters, you can do 64 ors or 65 ands or 65 nots all at the same time in a single cycle. It is 64 times faster than if you were to do them all as separate operations. Okay. And you know, in 45, you learn about SIMD and things like that that make the calculation more interesting. But that's that's the general idea. Okay, so let's let's do an exercise. So let's say uh, the user let's say the user C outs um, oh, 14 bitwise ended with seven, followed by an end. So if the user types in C out 14 bitwise anded with seven, bitwise and is again just a single ampersand, not two, one. What number is that going to print? Well, what is 14 in binary? 14 in binary is eight plus four plus two. There we go. Eight's bit, four's bit, two's bit, one's bit. Okay, so it's eight plus four plus two plus zero is 14. And then seven is four plus two plus one. Okay, so if we bitwise and all these, these digits together, what do we what do we get? True anded with false is what? Yeah, it's, it's mostly because there's no competition at the bandwidth level, right? For bandwidth, there are very few companies that supply internet. There's at and and Comcast. It's usually a duopoly in most places in America. Some places it's a monopoly. Some places only one company will provide internet. Um, and, but in most places in America, it's a duopoly. You can either get it through cable or you can get it through uh, your phone, as if you have phone anymore. Um, Starlink might make a difference, might break that open. Uh, what they found was when Google Fiber came into a town, uh, first of all, the cable and AT&T would try blocking them, filing lawsuits. They would tie up the the... Google Fiber would need to run things along telephone wires and they would leave their wires there to block Google from coming in because Google can't move their wires. They have to move their wires and they just forget, oh, I'm sorry, but you can't install because we're here. Sorry, we'll get out of the way in a year or two or three. You know, And so Google actually gave up the fiber business because Comcast and AT&T were just um, being highly uncooperative. But what they found was that in areas where Google Fiber did come in, the price of Comcast and the price of AT&T plummeted and they offered more bandwidth. Hey, competition's a good thing. Look at that. 
But uh, they were able to basically just uh, drag their feet and cause Google to just get tired of the whole business. So, you know, in my opinion, Google Fiber had a real opportunity for being, you know, a game changer. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the America we live in. Uh, municipality is starting their own service and it being way better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my buddy lives in Palo Alto and he um, is on the HOA for his condo board, so he negotiated with a fiber optic company to bring fiber optic into his complex. Everybody in the complex gets fiber optic for, I don't know, 50 bucks a month or something. And they get gigabit ethernet at fiber optic speeds and latencies. So cheaper, faster. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the, it, it's not, it's not accurate to say that what we have with at t and, um, Comcast is capitalism because it's government enforced duopoly. Right, you cannot come in and move like you can't run wires on the telephone poles. There's all these things are very highly regulated things, and so Starlink is a way of bypassing it. Who knows? Maybe we'll see Starlink explode the duopoly. Right? We can hope. Okay. So what do we got? What do we got? Fourteen ended with seven. It's not fourteen plus seven. It's not fourteen plus seven. It is fourteen bitwise ended with seven. So what do we got? 14 bitwise and the seven. So for the first pair of bits here, the output is gonna be zero. Second pair of bits, one ended with one is one, one ended with one is one, zero ended with one is zero. Six. Okay. So 14 ended with seven is six. Okay. And so some people will sometimes use single and instead of the double and and they will be confused when their code doesn't work sometimes. Because look, this is true. Like, that's true, that's true, the result is true. Cool, it must always work, right? Mm. <laughs> Let's try now. Let's try 10 bitwise anded with five, okay? Um, this bitwise and is not a substitute for logical and, right? Five logically anded with two is always gonna be true, right? True anded with true is true. Um, with bitwise, you can have a true ended with true and get false, zero, like in this case. So with 10, uh, 8, 4, 2, 1, 10 is going to be 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 8's digit, 2's digit, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 is 5. So 10 ended with 5, you can see 1 ended with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So <laughs> If you have a bitwise a, a, a number with its number divided by two, uh, it, well, no, because they could have, you can have runs with ones, but yeah, basically there's no guarantee that you can um, that you will get a true a true result. In this case, ten bitwise anded with five is zero, right? Because what it does, it does a bit, it does an and operation on every corresponding pair of bits. You guys understand that? It takes time from satellite to signal to receiver. Yeah, the, the big question for me is how much latency Starlink's gonna have. Like uh, one of my friends just signed up for Starlink yesterday. I think it's a refundable deposit of like a thousand bucks, something like that. Um, but the big question, and he lives up in uh, Yosemite Lakes or something like that. The big question is latency. Like how long does it take light to travel up, get processed and to travel back down? What are the practical uses to incorporate something like 14 anded with seven? Well, I'm showing you with an inventory. Okay, so here is the and, now let's do or. Okay, or does an or operation on each matching pair of bits. So if you have 11110000, bitwise or with 00001111, we compare the first bit in each and the output is one, compare the second and the output is one, and so on and so forth, it's up to the last one, it's your one, okay. So if we were to take 12 and bitwise or it with seven, uh, we would have eight, four, two, one. So 12 is eight plus four, seven is one, 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 right? So if we were to or these things together, what you do is you take each pair of bits, true or with false is true, true or with true is true, false or with true is true, false or with true is true, and so the answer, 12, 
12 bitwise or it was seven is 15. Okay. It's not, it's not addition. It's bitwise or you just have to take each pair of bits and or them. Okay. Um, wireless and wired are the same. I don't know, man. I, I refuse to use anything but ethernet for my machine here. There's so many Wi-Fi networks in the area. Like, yeah. Okay, so do you guys understand this? So if you want to turn a bit on, if you want to turn a bit on, like uh, you do this, you'd say x is equal to x bitwise or to four. That's how you pick up an item. This would be a constant, obviously. So if x before was like, I don't know, nine or something like that, so eight, four, two, one. So if we had uh, the uh, if we had the right key before, and we had the axe or something, and we're saying pick up the dandelion, then what's going to happen? It's going to bitwise or that with zero one zero zero, and the at the end of the day we're going to have one one zero one, and so this bit which corresponds to the axe is still true. It's true before. It's true now. The bit corresponding to the dandelion. I don't know why we're picking up dandelions in a game that has axes, but there you go, it's like Valheim or something. We picked up a, uh, a dandelion. We still don't have the blue key and we still have the red key. That's the red key right there. Okay. And so by doing a bitwise or, you can pick up an item. It leaves all the other bits alone. And if you pick up the same item multiple times, it doesn't overflow into the next category. That's it. So in order to pick up something, you just say, you know, inventory is equal to inventory bitwise or with um, the red key. And then that will set whichever bit red key is, it'll set it. That's how you set a bit in a bit. Okay. Um, I don't like wireless mice because they run out of charge at inopportune times. Okay, so, um, not flips the bits. So if we have um, one, 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 zero, 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 the not operation is the tilde, the cheat key character tilde, right? It means flip to bits, flip the bits. True becomes false, false becomes true. So for all the bits in the bit field, um, all the bits in the bit field that were true are false now, all the ones that were false before are true now. 1010101 turns into 0101011. Oh, one turns into one zero. One 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 zero one one becomes zero one one zero zero one zero zero. Okay. And so we use we use bitwise not in conjunction with bitwise and in order to drop an item. So if you have let's say you have uh, you have the axe, you have the blue key. You have the red key. Let's say you want to drop the axe on the ground. What you can do is say inventory is equal to inventory bitwise anded with the not of x. So if the axe is one zero zero zero, it's eight in this case, the fourth bit is x. Bitwise nodding axe turns it into zero one one one. And if we end if we end this value here with this value here, then one ended with zero is zero, zero ended with one is zero, one ended with one is one, one ended with one is one. And so we have, look at this. Before we had the axe, we had the blue key, we had the red key. Now we have the red key and the blue key. But we do not have the axe. The axe is not with us anymore. So we pick up things. If you want to pick up the axe, you would write code like this. Inventory equals inventory bitwise ORD with the axe. If you want to drop it, this is the pattern. Okay. Is it? 
debate online about uh, whether wired or wireless mice are better. Everybody knows wired mice are better from Lydia. Come on. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I used to use a wired mouse and I actually plugged it in. I actually it had an optional wire and I actually just attached it and just used it as a wired mouse. Okay, um, that was my Sensei, Steel Series Sensei something. Okay. Um, my new mouse though. This is a Sensei 310 that I'm using right here. It's pretty decent. It's not the best mouse in the world, but it's pretty decent. Okay, so uh, so our th XOR flips bits, shift shift bits. Um, let's worry about that in just a second, but here's some actual code. So if uh, we've got axe, which corresponds to the first bit, and single-barreled shotgun, which corresponds to the second bit, and double barreled shotgun, which corresponds to the third bit, and the elegant, which corresponds to the fourth. You can see if you have an item in the bit field by doing this, okay? So if our bit field is 1101, this means we have the ax, we do not have the single barreled shotgun, we do have the double barreled shotgun, and we do have the nail gun. And we know that in code by using bitwise and. So if we take our inventory, which is 1101, and end it with axe, axe is 0001, it's just the number one, right? If we bitwise end these together, we get 0001, which is true. So it'll print and my axe. And if we want to see if we have the single barreled shotgun, we take the inventory, which is 1101, and end it with 0010, and you see we get 0000, which is false. So it will not print, and you have my single barreled shotgun. Okay, that's, that's it. So these are the three patterns. For doing a bit field, there's three patterns you have to know. This pattern here for searching a bit field. This pattern here for setting a bit in a bit field. And this pattern here for clearing a bit in a bit field. That's it. You learn those three code patterns and you are good to go for the next homework assignment. Okay. So... Can you use these in a non-gaming scenario? All right. Do you guys understand? You will see this code, by the way, all the time. And like, if you ever look at like the Unix kernel, things like that. Um, Honestly, one of the most common data structures ever because it's in it. Uh, reads, it's called Linux, Linux hint. I want to see the actual source code for read. It's not helpful. Man page, tutorials point, not helpful, not helpful. Um, implementation. Right there. Flags is equal to flags bitwise ord with large file. Right? So uh, you pass in, there shouldn't be a comma there. Uh, you pass in, or that's a weird thing. Anyway, so you pass in flags, which is a bit field, and it says if uh, we call some function and we determine it's a large file, then we turn on the bit corresponding to it's a large file. Um, that is a bit field. Okay. Open flags. Look, these are powers of two. If flags ended with create or temp file. 
So this is actually doing two if statements at once. So this is saying if I if the flags field either has the create flag set or the temp file set. So you, rather than needing two separate if statements, you can have one if statement. It's much faster. It's twice as fast. You can have one if statement that does two tests at the same time. If either of these bits are set, if either of these bits are set in flags, then it will do this, where it is going to do a bitwise and and then a bit or and set the result here. Um, flags anded with the not of something. That clears this bit. And it also clears this bit. So it uh, it's clearing two of the bits. And I, I can just read that in English because um, anded with, no, let's see, the not of them both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these two guys get anded together and then that gets anded with the flags and so it's turning off two bits. And I can read that in English because I'm familiar with that pattern. And that pattern you will see a lot. So if uh, the sync flag is set, turn on the desync flag, right? Next step, we check to see if our flags contain osync. We need desync also. So what if desync was already set? It'll still be set. Bitwise or does not um, have any problems. If you pick up the red key and you pick up the red key again, congratulations, you still have the red key. You don't have two of them, you just have the red key. And so this is a this is saying if, if the osync flag is set, set the desync flag just in case the user didn't. Okay. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. If the temp file mask flag is set, uh, if the may write is set, uh, return a error, I think that is. So flags and equals, flags is equal to flags anded with O directory, O no follow, O path. So this is clearing all bits except for directory, no follow, and path. So you can have three different lines, three different commands take place at the same time. With a 64-bit bit field, you can do 64 sets, 64 clears, 64 tests, all in one command. It's, it's very compact, it's very efficient. Um, trunk is set, then turn on the may write flag. If append is set, turn on the may append flag. Like I said, you'll, you'll just see these things everywhere. And so you gotta, you gotta get comfortable with it. In fact, Muya just did a homework assignment in 45 called ASIM Bitwise, where they had to do bitwise operations. I think, right Muya, or did you not do it at all? <clears throat> you did it? Okay, good. Okay, so, yeah, so, sorry about shifting. So double left arrow and double right arrow are the shift operators in C++ and C. Uh, there is a... Where have you guys seen double left arrow and double right arrow before? Let's put it that way. Is bitwise or totally different from the pipe character? Yes. Completely different meaning. Except now in C++ 20, they have overloaded the bitwise or operator to do piping in the ranges lib, in ranges library. You can now pipe the results of a sort into something that selects the first half, which pipes it into shuffle, which pipes it into unique, I don't know. So uh, the, the, the vertical slash, the pipe character in Unix now can be used as a pipe character with the ranges library. So if you have a container, you can pipe the results of the container through a filter and pipe the results of that through another filter. And then, yeah, kind of cool. Where have, you, where have you guys seen it? Yeah, CN and CF, right? And so uh, the uh, when you say CN, when you say CN uh, into X, this is actually the bit shift. This is the bit shift, bit shift right command. And if you were to see out five, that means shift C out left five bits. And C people, uh, people who live in the C world, uh, don't like this very much because that means bit shift right, that means bit shift left. And what the hell, C++. You know, one of the rules for operators is that you should not use operators that don't match what the operator means, right? Like I could make, you know, I could make my own vector class, you know, called Beck or something, vector V and, 
I might have like vector square bracket five, and I can have this print hello world five times, right? I can, I can make an operator, I can make an operator square bracket that takes an integer X and what it does, it see outs, you know, for blah, 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 X times, see out hello world. But no, no, this is terrible. If, if I'm, if I write, if I see code like that, I'm expecting this to access element five out of a vector. I don't expect it to see out hello world five times. What the hell? You know, and that's the reaction of people from SeaWorld have at seeing this. The bit shift operators are for bit shifting. They shift bits left and right. They don't, they're not used for CNing and see outing. What the hell? They're not input and output. What the hell? And so uh, what happens if you take a bit like this and you left shift it once? Then it goes from being um, 0001 to 0010. So left shifting by one is the same thing as multiplying by two. All the bits move one to the left. So if I have uh, one, one, zero, zero, and I right shift it, so what is this? Eight plus four plus two plus one, this is 12. So if I take 12 and I right shift it twice, then this turns into zero, zero, one, one, right? So these bits, this bit travels to the right, that bit travels to the right, and so I've got three. So, so right shifting by two is the same thing as dividing by four. Every time you shift the bits left one, it's multiplying by two. Every time you shift the bits right one, it's dividing by two. Because you see how each bit corresponds to a power of two? So the eight bit becomes the four bit, the four bit becomes the two bit, the two bit becomes the one bit. All the bits are divided by two every time you shift once. So if you shift twice, you divide by two, you divide by two, divide by four. Okay. So if you want, if you, um, take a eight, right? And you right shift it three times, zero, 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 one. So eight right shifted three times is equal to one. It's division by eight. Divide by two, divide by two, divide by two. What if you left shift it? It's multiplying by two. Right? Now you have a question about overflow, right? So if a bit goes off the edge of the world, what happens? And uh, in general, it just, it vanishes. Same thing as like if you add two integers together and they, they're too big, they just overflow and wrap around. So is this related to modulus? Not really, not really. Um, there are ways you can do modulus using bit shifts that are kind of tricky, but no, but by default, this isn't modulus at all. It's, it's just moving all the bits to the left or moving all the bits to the right. Um, yeah, and so what, what Bar Bjarni Strustrup did was he said, hey, these things look like arrows. They look like, they look like arrows are flowing from the keyboard into the, into the variable. And this one looks like data is going out, right? So he overloaded the bit shift operators to do CN and Scout. The trouble with that is that there's actually order of operations issues. Right, so if you um, uh, like see out um, three left shifted one time, <laughs> it prints out three and one. Right? <laughs> no, I, no, I meant uh, three. I meant three left shifted one time. Right? Right? Or what if I do three bitwise anded with one? Three bitwise anded with one should be one, right? Nope. <laughs> so what happens is that there's order of operation. So it does this first and that returns C out. Then it tries taking C out and bitwise anding C out with one at which you can't do. You cannot bitwise and the output stream with one. So this does not work. And so uh, it's a it's a common mistake um, that students make is they don't know they need parentheses there in a lot of cases because there's an order, because it's the bit shift operator. It should have a much lower priority. If it was using for output, it should be at like the bottom tier of priority. But because it's the, literally the bit shift operator, it has the same priority you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, right? Order of operations. It has the same priority as all the other bit, bit operations. And so you can't, 
uh, you can't just yeah you, know, you have to you have to put parentheses around things when you don't when in in reality you shouldn't have to. So, um, okay, so let's do an inventory system. So our three things are to add to a bit field, delete from bit field, and see if a bit field is set. Okay. Um, here, say from the top, give me some items. Like, let's cooperatively just give me some items that I can pick up. Maybe we'll just make eight of them, make this an eight-bit inventory. So give me some items. Spoon. Shovel. Food. What kind of food? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be more precise. What kind of food? What kind of food am I in the mood for? There will be another benchmarking assignment, yeah. Plus eight. Bread. Equals 16. Five, okay. Knife. All right, equals. Knife equals 32. Axe equals 64. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can have one more item. Mr. Singh, uh, Mr. Singh, you said food. Give me, give me your favorite food. What kind of food do you like? <clears throat> Steak. Steaky. That's Japanese, by the way. Steaky. Everybody thinks there's no cognates in Japanese with English because it's a, you know. Oh, man. There are so many cognates in Japanese with English. It's crazy. Do you know how to say skiing in Japanese? Ski. Party. Party. Depato. Department store. Super. Supermarket. <laughs> Steaky. Steak. It's not like Mandarin. In Mandarin, there's like zero cognates. Yeah. Japanese has so much English in it. It's really cool. All right. So there are six items. And do you guys remember enums? This is the same thing as if I had written constant spoon equals one, shovel equals two, All right? Same thing. Okay. So uh, we start with no inventory. All right. So we will do a while true here, and we will say uh, int choice is equal to read. Uh, please choose. Yeah. Let's not be polite. Let's just do this. Add to bit field. Pick up an item to see if we have an item. Three, drop an item. Four, quit. No. If choice is less than one or a choice is greater than three, and by the way, this is why I use or. Uh, you'll see a lot of people use double vertical slashes. The reason for that is because in my head, I say or, what comes out will oftentimes be bitwise or, you know? Um, and so I, um, that's why I literally write and and or um, instead. So I don't mentally write the wrong operation. If choice is less than one or choice is greater than three, then we will break and we're done. Technically in this case, I guess, I think bitwise or would work the same way. Yeah, it? it would, it would, but it's a bad habit to be in especially when you have a complicated expression. 
Um, because there's an order of operations issue. Like if you have ands and ors and bitwise ands and bitwise ors together, um, you can you can have orders of operation surprises that you don't expect. Um, okay, so but yeah, and something simple like this, bitwise or would behave exactly the same way. Break. Okay. Uh, so if choice one. Okay, so if we're going to pick up an item, uh, we will say int. Um, hmm, hmm. We're going to do this. Hmm. We're going to do this. We need some helper functions. So let's throw this up into global space here. There's also video games, uh, a lot of games by Zachtronics. Shenzhen IO, um, KS100. Those are programming games. You program things. They're good mental workouts. Okay, so we're going to um, toss all these options up in the global space. Why not? Um, and we will have a menu of options, maybe? Yeah, probably. Probably a good idea. Void, print, menu of options. And, um, Y two Y paste shift J to join shift J to join. Okay, so I've got all this stuff here, and I could come through and go delete 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 delete. Right? You know what I mean? And repeat, rinse and repeat, but I am going to do a macro. All right. So Q, Q, start recording macro Q, and I'm going to go one, two, three, four X's, word, word, back a letter, and save. Let's see if that works. At Q, good, worked. And then I can just type at, 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 at. Oops. Nope, nope, didn't work. Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, it's because it's more than four letters, yeah. Let's see, uh, Q, um, Q, delete two words, no, nope. delete three words. That's the better way. Don't, don't hard code how many letters it is unless you know what you're doing. Uh, word, word, back align, and save the macro at Q, good, at, 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 and there we go. So, if you ever have uh, to process and transform large amounts of stuff like that, then um, there you go. Okay, so what is it complaining about? What is, why is it underlined? I don't know. Does that look fine? Does that look fine? Okay. So we'll just call print menu and I guess technically we don't need a function for that. Oops. Put that there. Hmm. Okay, so choice one. All right, so we're, we're going to need some sort of function to convert between um, a string and the choice, right? So, um, and vice versa, which is kind of annoying. Right. So we will have an option called. Stuff to string. We'll take in a stuff. Can you uh, can you do a 
Uh, that probably won't work, but can you do an E number of pairs? You could. Not exactly. You can make a vector. Or a map. Uh, a map's the way to do this, really. Uh, yeah. But, um... Hmm. Eh, whatever. I'll just... I'm invested. All right. String, uh, right val equals error. All right. So do you guys know what I'm doing here? I guess I should ask that. So I want the user to type in, like, pick up a shovel, see if we have a shovel, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe we could add in, like, print the entire inventory of that kind of stuff, too. Uh, but we need to go back and forth between the user typing in matches and knowing that matches is four. Or the other way around, if you have the matches to be able to print, you have the matches. So you have to know that four maps to matches and matches maps to four. So the right way of doing this is probably with an unordered map, right? Mm. Probably, definitely. Easier than a easier than a um, big old if statement, but whatever. All right. All right. Um, okay, so unordered map. We're gonna map between strings and stuff, which is just init, named um, string to stuff, and then we'll need a mapping the other way, which maps between stuff and strings, all right, so this guy is going to be holding Spoon, which maps to one, or uh, let's do this spoon. Shovel, which maps to shovel. You notice I'm starting to get annoyed at having to type this. And my brain is already like, write a macro, write a macro to do it. Old macro is still there, still working. Look at that. All right. So I've got these things here. And so I'm going to write a new macro. This macro is called W. Why not? And I'm going to insert open curly brace, walk forward a character, yank a word, walk forward a, walk forward a uh, word, P to paste, A to append, close quote, escape, B to go backwards, I to insert, damn it, I did this backwards, didn't I? Undo, undo, undo. Okay, let's try this again. QW, all right. Yank a word, move forward a word, paste, backwards, 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 insert, open curly boy, Double quote, escape, WW, insert, double quote, escape, word, word, backwards one letter, close curly, damn it, I wasn't in insert mode. Ah, so close, so close. Okay. Uh, insert, word, word, back align, insert mode, close curly boy, comma. And then where did I start? Did I start at the first part of the letter? I think I did, so Q, no. Uh, escape, Q, and then let's try this. At W, nope. At W, I don't remember where I started the macro. Uh, all right, let's try this again. QW, yank word, W to go forward, P to paste, backwards, 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 insert, open curly boy, double quote, escape, word, word, insert, word, word, back a letter, insert, close curly boy, 
comma, and escape. At W. <laughs> at, 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 and we are done. Almost. Put that in here. Screwed up on the last one. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, yeah, and so this is, you know, you could probably do this by hand if you had eight things, but if you had 64 things in your inventory, then you want to write a macro. Trust me on this. You want to write a macro. Okay. So, uh, spork, bread, knife, axe, and the final one, uh, which a lot of times the final one will mess up because you can't go beyond the end. Sticky. And we join the next line and we call it a day. So this, this is a mapping from a string to the bit that it corresponds to. So if the user types in bread, then the mapping will give us 16. And uh, if they type anything else, uh, ignore it or something, right? If the user types in ax, it'll give us 64. So this is a mapping from a string to the enum that it corresponds to. And then uh, yy, P, for the next one, we are going to do another macro. Stuff to string, except it's going to be the opposite. So if the user if the user types in one, or, or if we find one in the bit field, then we can print you have the spoon. Yeah, so stuff to string, string to stuff. What is going on here? What's what's the problem here? Matching instructor, stuff to string. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, again, macro time. All right. At W. Damn it. Sorry. Q. No. Start of the, start of the, okay. We're starting at the first quote. QW, quoting a macro. X, W, X. A, close quote, escape. W. W, insert, double quote, escape, word, word, back a letter, stop, at, W, at, 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 you guys see that? I saw that. So uh, we've got two hash tables. The first hash table, you enter a, you, it searches for a string, and it gives you what bit that it gives you what bit that string corresponds to. The other way around, you punch in a bit, and it gives you the string that bit corresponds to. And so I just use a little bit of Vim macro magic, so I didn't have to type all that stuff by hand. Now let's just see if this compiles because I'm getting a uh, bit field. So you see, that's the annoying part of these things, by the way. It's just the mapping between input and an enum. Because enums aren't first class citizens, so to speak. You can't iterate across an enum. You can't turn them into strings, that kind of stuff. So that's the annoying part. And of your homework assignment, this is going to be the annoying part. So learn Vim macros. They're really cool. All right, so now that we got that handled, we can do this. So. Um, we are going to read a string. So we're going to say string input equals read. Please choose from the list above an item to add. And then um, if string to stuff, that's our map, dot count. You guys remember what count does? It counts how many times that string appears in the hash table. So if it does not appear, if string to stuff count equals zero, so if they type in like garbage, that's not in the hash table, and then we can just print um, scout, sorry, that is not a valid item to pick up. And we'll just continue on our merry way. It'll jump back up here and continue, okay? Otherwise, we know it is in the hash table. And so we can get a uh, int bit is equal to string.
string to stuff square bracket input. And so this is going to return which bit we want. So if they typed in the string shovel, then this will return two because we have a, a mapping between shovel and two. So bit will be set to two. If they type in shovel, bit is set to two. Right, and let's just verify this for now. We, I've typed for a while. So let's just verify this. G plus plus, bit field. Never trust your code works until you've run it at least once. <clears throat> pick up an item, we'll pick up spoon. Spoon is one. Pick up matches, matches is four. Pick up the knife, the knife is 32. Cool, so our mapping is working. So the user can type in a string and it will, um, right now it's just returning what bit that corresponds to. Okay. Uh, there should be a following bit, the canvas of the Vim cheat sheet. Uh, there is, yeah, yeah there is. Okay, okay so, um, so now we just need to add it. So how do we add that bit to our inventory? Our inventory is right here. How do we add, how do we pick up an item? How do we add a bit to a bit field? Do you guys remember? Bitwise or, very good. Inventory is equal to inventory bitwise or with a bit. If the bit's already set, true, or with true is true, it doesn't do anything. If the bit was not set before, it's gonna be set now. Okay. Ah, uh, fine, oh yeah, fine. Okay. All right. And then we'll just do the same thing for the other options. Probably just move this up, one, two, three, five. D60, left shift, six lines. Please choose from the list above an item. So I'm just gonna, rather than copy and pasting this, I'm just gonna, for all of them, uh, find out what item they want on. And this will get the bit that item corresponds to. And then if the choice is one, we pick it up. If the choice is two, we see if we have it. See out um, if inventory ended with bit. So we have the Third option is to drop it. So we say inventory is equal to inventory bitwise ended with the not of the bit. And you don't need the uh, parentheses there, but it might make it a little more clear. And just to make my TA happy. All right, so, oh cool, these are all one liners, except for the. Probably shouldn't erase the curly braces, but whatever. So that's it. One line of code, insert. One line of code, search. I just have two lines here because it prints out one thing if you have it, prints out the other if you don't. Mm, here, even simpler. Um,
There you go. <laughs> Insert. Search. Delete. That's it. That's an entire implementation of a data structure. One line of code insert, one line of code to see if it's in there, one line of code to delete it. Um, that's your next homework assignment. So your next homework assignment is going to be implementing an inventory system okay. with some twists. There's three different inventory systems you have to implement. Um, and the first one is just basic. You just can pick up and drop different items. And then uh, uh, the, the other two have some rules, like some items are mutually exclusive. If you have the spoon, you can't have a spork. I don't know, something like that, right? And so a, a couple of them are a little bit more, um, they got some twists, you got, you got to add to it. One of them is like, find the best weapon I have. So you have to use, um, you have to go through the bits and uh, find the, the highest bit, basically. Yeah. So any questions about this? this is, uh, read a bit from an integer, set a bit on an integer, delete a bit from an integer. And you just basically treat those 64 bits, or those, in this case, 8 bits, as just 8 different variables. Very common in computer science. You will, you will see um, bit packing like this used in a lot of different areas. You're doing file compression, image compression, um, like I said, operating systems. Uh, anytime you interface with any C library, C libraries love this because rather than having to pass eight variables you can pass one variable this is a char and each bit in the char means something different you know hmm. I should probably test the code michael con cocky like yeah here we go let's try to pick up an item pick up the shovel do we have the shovel we have shovel Two. That was actually the bit it was returning. I wanted to print true and false. Okay, so let's pick up the knife. Let's see if we have the spoon. We have spoon, false. Let's see if we have an item, knife. We have knife, true. Drop an item, knife. See if we have the knife, no. Okay. Okay, so copy bit field up into public. CHP, pseudo, deploy homework, CSI 41, uh, inventory. Flores does not exist, well, that's unfortunate. Okay. Um, so for this assignment, become panu um, cd inventory. So for this assignment, CSI 40 version of stuff, that's fine. So, uh, put center table, that's interesting. Why, why is that in there? Oh, this is the wrong assignment. Shoot. Ignore that one. Sorry about that. That's the wrong assignment. Um, it's not the inventory assignment. Uh, it is bit field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Let me read that out. It's a different assignment. Um, let's try that again. Pseudo deploy homework. We will deploy to you bit field. Ignore the inventory assignment. Or do it if you want. Could be fun. Could be fun exercise. All right. Become Tanu. Uh, CD, not inventory, bit field. Okay, so for this homework assignment, you are going to be um, learning how to do inheritance. Uh, again, with this assignment, it's kind of set up for you already, so you don't have to do it, but that's going to be the topic for next time. We're going to be learning about inheritance next time. It's the last major thing in this class besides bit fields. Um, but um, yeah, you learn about enums. Learn about exceptions, uh, refresh around overloading operators, and Vim macros, which is really, really useful and time saving. Wow, that, was, that white text is bright, dude. Okay, so yeah, so uh, this is actual code, by the way. Uh, this is actually actual code uh, that was copied and pasted from 
code that I wrote that is from a game that over a million people have played. And so this is actually how the code is, and um, you're going to get to work with it. So for this assignment, there's going to be three different bit fields, one for what keys you have, red, yellow, green, blue. Notice all of them are powers of two. Um, whenever you work with a bit field, all the things you can pick up are powers of two, because each bit is a power of two, right? One's bit, two's bit, four's bit, eight's bit. So whenever you do a bit field, it's going to be a power of two, unless you're doing something like that where you're like adding different bits together and things like that. But each each individual bit is going to correspond to something. Like I, if I have the orange key, that's that bit. Okay. Uh, it's a game called Custom Team Fortress. It's a modification of Team Fortress that allows you to build your own class. So it's reasonably popular. People still play it today, so it's pretty cool. And so, uh, yeah, so you can see there's three different enums, basically. Um, different though. This is one kind of enum. This is actually just making the constants. And then this is the C world way of doing it, which is using hashtag define. It's exact, all three of them are functionally equivalent to each other. Uh, I just want you to be, you know, experience it, just kind of looking at different ways that people make masses of, of constants like that. Your inventory is going to be in a uh, unsigned integer 64. And uh, you're going to be doing, uh, you're going to be doing, um, yeah, so the operators um, are those three things that I told you. Insert, search, and delete. <clears throat> insert, you're going to overload the plus equals operator to do insert. You're going to overload the minus equals operator to do delete. <clears throat> you're gonna overload the double equals operator to do search. And so these things are gonna be around one line of code. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's most of the assignment right there and each of those is gonna be one line of code and I've shown you in both the PowerPoint presentation and what I just showed you right now, which is up in the public directory how you can add a bit, how you can clear a bit, how you can test a bit. Okay. So that's most of it right there. Three lines of code for most of it. And then um, there's some twists, like I said. You can't have two different jobs, that's impossible. Nobody can have two jobs at once. Um, for the weapons, there needs to be a function written called find the best weapon, where you need to find the best weapon you have. But basically, yeah. Dope, I didn't know you were moderate. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was actually at Fry's one time and the guy in front of me was talking about my mod and I was like, it's cool. I'm famous. I heard one person talking about it. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's it. It's been pushed out to you guys. Don't do inventory. Just ignore that. <laughs> uh, it's in the bit field directory. Okay. It'll be due in a week. Rip Fry's, I know, I know. Um, yep, so the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation is lecture 20. If you want to read that at your leisure, you can review that. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty straightforward assignment. Um, again, don't wait to the last second. Again, if you get stuck, ask in the help center. That's what it's here for. It's, it's, it's just really sad to me when people don't do a homework assignment. And they don't even like try. You know, it's like, just try, you know, and if you get stuck, then ask for help and start early enough that you can get unstuck. And I don't know, this one's not a lot of code. So give it a shot. Easy 10 points. Okay. We're going to find the PowerPoint. It's in the file section on Canvas. All my lectures are uploaded there. Okay. All the PowerPoints, I should say. The lectures are on the module section. Okay. All right. Thanks, you guys. Peace out, and I will see you next time.